Good evening, ladies. We're so glad you're here with us tonight. We're looking forward to, to discussing and learning about the last half of Galatians with Sandy tonight. Uh, we have a couple of little adjustments going on tonight. Crystal is not feeling well. Please to keep her in your prayers. Uh, she, Nisha will be teaching at, will be leading, uh, facilitating at Crystal's table. Sandy will be facilitating at Leah's table. She's had kind of a rough week and is not feeling well, has a headache. So just both of them, please keep them in your prayers. Um, uh, let's see. Karen. Was there, Karen. Oh, Karen is at home with her sweet grandbaby. She's over at Laura's house. They had the baby over the weekend. I'm sorry I'm giving her news away. But uh, I told her, yeah, she's not here. I told her, I said, I'm glad you were in Sunday school. I was afraid I would have to tell somebody. So I'm so glad for them. The baby is beautiful and healthy, and it's just a lovely, lovely um, opportunity for her to bond and to help. So she is away from us tonight. Uh, but we are excited about what God's going to do. He has a plan, and we're excited to be part of it. And so we're going to pray and get started. Father, thank you so very much for the way that you love us and take care of us. Thank you that you know everything that happens, everything that touches us. And Father, we pray that we would honor you with our lives, that our reasonable service would be to obey what you teach us, to learn and to grow and to look like Jesus. Amen. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Oh, and one other announcement. Um, we are not going to be doing first and foremost on Wednesday this month in November. We are going to be doing it on Sunday. And the reason is we'll be meeting in here in the gathering place. And the reason is we're going to be joining with the Hispanic church. So Pastor Adrian and Pastor John Mark really wanted to, to come together in prayer. And we're going to celebrate communion as well with the Hispanic church. So um, if you've been coming to first and foremost, it's, just the sweetest, hugest blessing. Um, and so I just strongly encourage you all to come out and be a part of it. So, good evening. Wait. Yes, ma'am. So what Sunday? Well, what it, I, you know what I thought as I'm talking to him and I'm like, I wish I knew what the date was. I meant to look at my calendar. Whatever, I don't, whatever that Wednesday is that we would have met, We'll send you out an email. <laughs> because I don't know if it's the Sunday before or the Sunday after. I, I, I'm sorry. That, no, no it, that was a good a question. question. I should have said what I was thinking. I don't know when it is. It's a Sunday. <laughs> um, but it's... We can include it in the letter that goes on on Monday. Yes, on Monday's letter, you will get the date. Probably okay, I'll know it. that. But I'm going to tell you all this. I found out about this from Connie. Because Randy found out about it, her husband, from Miss Vicky. And so I get an email, so I call my husband. I'm like, are we, and I'm like, I got, I'm going to confess. I was mad at him. <laughs> like, I, I have a plan here. And so anyway, so what we're going to do is we're going to meet on that Wednesday. And now we have one extra week at the end that we're going to do something there. Trust me, you don't want to miss. So, okay? All right. So, we're midway through the month of October, and while you may think the month of October is all about fall and all about Halloween, October has also another focus. October is National Family History Month. Who knew that? I didn't. <laughs> I don't even know how I, I came across this. Um, but what is National Family History Month? It is a proclamation the United States Senate established in 2001 to commemorate the importance of sharing and capturing family stories. Millions of Americans are researching the history of their families, said Utah Republican Orrin Hatch when he introduced the bill. Experts say that in the United States, genealogy is now the second most popular hobby next to gardening. It is believed that more than 80 million Americans are currently actively searching for more information about their ancestors. I came across an article in Psychology Today posted almost exactly two years ago, October 13, 2020, height of COVID, and it was entitled, Why Are Americans Obsessed with Genealogy? And the tagline read, how 
we became a nation invested in understanding our family histories. The article began by saying October is a good time to consider why we've become a nation consumed by genealogy. How appropriate for us as well. For tonight, we're going to gratefully dive in and hopefully become consumed by our genealogy as well, our spiritual genealogy. Genealogical subscription services have become big business in America. The article stated that one investment giant acquired a majority stake in Ancestry.com, a deal worth $4.7 billion. Today, just a little over 20 years into the creation of recreational DNA testing for Ancestry, more than 35 million people have taken a DNA test to match to genetic relatives and predict where in the world their genes came from. The majority of these takers are Americans. The article asks, why are Americans so into their past right now? In the height of COVID, how did the lives of the dead become our national obsession? The article states that we've become a nation of archeologists excavating the past to better understand ourselves. But what exactly fuels this desire to look backward? What are we looking for? And then what do we do when we find it? This writer's findings stated that we search out a sense of we search out of a sense of rootlessness. We look because human beings are natural born storytellers. And we want to know how our once upon a time fits into the narratives of our lives. We look because genealogy has a way of making abstract history real. And we want to know if the past has guidance for us. And then it goes on to describe us as the unfortunate occupants of a chaotic present whose future we can't yet see. The article also goes on to say we also desire to know if there's any precedent for our natural, natural tendencies, like our talents, and why do I have this color hair, and why does my nose look this way, and what's the story behind my family's idiosyncrasies. We look for patterns and explanations, and we hope the past can shed some light on the present. And at the height of the pandemic, the article stated, at this very moment, we also look because of a fear of present circumstances. Tomorrow isn't promised, one woman realized in the midst of COVID-19 fever, committing herself to find her biological father. And this article in Psychology Today also listed benefits that can be derived from researching our family history. And three of those were particularly interesting that suit our research of our family history. We receive a sense of purpose, a deeper personal identity and family connection. And during my consultation with Dr. Google, I also learned about lineage societies. Lineage societies are clubs, groups, and organizations that you are allowed to join or not based on your ancestry. They gave the examples, you've probably heard of the Daughters of the American Revolution, one of the better known lineage societies accepts applications for membership from women who can prove they are descended from someone who fought or provided assistance to the colonial cause in the American Revolution. A lot of research goes into lineage society applications. So you know when you're accepted into one, you really are descended from a prestigious, prominent, or famous person. And I learned that most lineage societies have similar requirements for joining. You must prove your descent from a person who was involved in the particular thing that the society celebrates. Do you see where we're headed? This is what we will explore tonight. The proof we need declaring that we belong to the most prestigious lineage society that has ever been with the glorious benefits of a sense of purpose, a deeper personality, personal identity and family connections. And the really great news, the really, really great news 
The burden of proof does not fall on us at all. It is his grace that has done that for us. It is his grace that works to prove our lineage. I didn't have a really happy childhood, but I did have a family. I had a Cuban daddy that was way too good looking for his own marriage and way too little willpower. I had a hardworking, stunningly beautiful mother who worked two jobs to provide for my sister and me. But that meant she wasn't home a lot. And when she was home, she relieved the pressure of her bitter life with wine, lots and lots of wine. But Proverbs does say, give wine to him whose life is bitter. My sister and I were left to ourselves, left alone a lot. And we were certainly not the best disciplinarians that two young teens needed. When I got saved, God gave me a family I never dreamed possible. And one of the most miraculous wonders of it is all, my mom, my sister, and my daddy all live in heaven now with Jesus. My mom returned to the Lord having been raised by two amazing Christian parents. And she went home to be with the Lord in 1997. My daddy came to faith in Christ at the age of 62 five months after I got saved and I invited him to church. And he went home to be with the Lord at the age of 96. And I'm telling you, until from the age of 62 to 96, he preached to everybody that came across his way and told them about Jesus. He was so in love with Jesus. And now he's in heaven. And I had the privilege of leading my sister to the Lord after she had emergency neck surgery. Don't get, don't get worried. I'm not having that. After she had an emergency neck surgery and she died on the table, not once, but twice, and God brought her back so that she could hear the message of the gospel of grace. She lived two more years after that as a quadriplegic, but now she's dancing in heaven with Jesus. She went home in 2013. But beyond the, the earthly family that I have now, my incredible husband of 39 and a half years, my daughter Sarah, my son Noah, my two Son, my two children in love, Brian and Lauren, and my great grand treasures, they're not great grandchildren, but they're great grand treasures, Sailor Grace, Eleanor Ann, Asher Benjamin, and Theodore George. I never get over the fact, the family that I have. But besides them, God has immeasurably, immeasurably blessed me with the spiritual family to do life with. And both these families have one distinct thing in common. These families came into existence by birth. Last week we talked about his grace that bequeaths our inheritance. And the reality is, in order to receive an inheritance, you have to be born in the line, in the lineage of the one who bequeaths that inheritance. Jesus himself said, if we want to be in line for, for inheritance, we must be born into his kingdom. We must be born again. John 3, 2, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Why? Jesus went on to say, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now think about birth. How much did the infant really have to do with the birthing process? And this is where Paul's going to pick up writing this evening as he undertakes the task of sorting out the Galatians' confusion about their spiritual birth and their spiritual lives. Paul had been a part of the Galatians' new birth, a spiritual midwife, if you will. And he wrote in 419, and this is where we're picking up tonight in Galatians, my children with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. A midwife is a health professional trained to support and care for women during pregnancy, labor, and birth. And the primary meaning of a midwife is a person who assists women in childbirth. But the term can also be used to refer to someone who helps produce or bring forth something new. Thus, a spiritual midwife is a person who plays a, a helpful role in bringing forth new spiritual life. 
Of course, it is his grace that works to produce the new spiritual life, but God uses others that he places in our lives to help create an environment and the necessary conditions where new spiritual life can emerge. While our initial birth is God's work alone that he imparts when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, he does continue to bring forth new spiritual life in us. New commitments, new understandings, new surrender. But as we know, birth is messy and usually painful. And sometimes seems as though the long-awaited day will never arrive. And Paul seems to have a similar image in mind. Feeling the concern of the spiritual midwife resolved to offer every bit of care and support to see life come to fruition. The New Living Translation translates the verse this way. Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again, and they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. Paul's heart for these Galatians. But now these Galatians found themselves living with a sense of rootlessness. And they were rooted now in legalism. And Paul finds himself wishing he could see them so that he might understand the most effective way to address his, his concern over their current condition. But I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tune, for I am perplexed about you. Change my tongue. He might have been singing. It might have been his tune. <laughs> but he can't be with them. But Paul would do all that he could to protect his beloved children in the faith and to combat the lies of the Judaizers that threatened to ensnare them in bondage once more. And Paul would systematically take them back, back to their roots by uprooting the tares that had been sown among them. In Matthew 13, Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. And Paul knew this was exactly what had happened. The enemy had snuck in and sown tares among the Galatians in order to bring the children of faith back into the bondage of works, convincing them that this was the mandatory means of spiritual growth. Warren Wearsby said this, legalism does not mean the setting of spiritual standards. It means worshiping these standards and thinking we are spiritual because we obey them. It also means judging other believers on the basis of these standards. Rather than being rooted in grace and freedom to worship the risen Christ, the enemy sought to plant them back into a system of works a false system that relied on an outer display of dead works and resulted in judgmentalism and the fear of being judged. But Paul was a committed midwife, and he would not desert his patients in the midst of their pain and the mess that they now found themselves in. The mess of being gripped by the fear of man rather than the glory of God. The havoc that forgetting their own history was now wreaking the confusion that was leading them away from the truth to turn again to the works of the flesh and the lies that were choking out the reality of all that his grace had accomplished. But no matter how messy, Paul would fight for his beloved patient because, after all, he knew the cause of their mess, as he'd already shared in chapter 2. It was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to to bring us into bondage. Just what Jesus said, the enemy sneaks in and sows the tares. But Paul says, we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. And so now, in a sense, Paul is going to fight fire with fire. The Judaizers had ignited the Galatians by their fiery zeal for the law. The Judaizers had been relentless in throwing the law up as the standard of faith claiming to be experts as though they had an inside corner on God's law. But remember who Paul was? Paul was Saul, the Pharisee, trained under the highly esteemed Gamaliel, 
or however you say his name, who had been taught in the extensive, scrupulous study, memorization, and knowledge of the law. And can't you just hear Paul? Okay, Judaizers, you want to talk law? Let's talk law. Tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? Five times in the book of Galatians, Paul quoted the law prefaced by it is written, and seven times he makes a reference to what scripture says. In other words, so Judaizers, let's look at the law, and let's hear what the law has to say. And at this point, Paul really goes after their sacred cow, their hold on the guarantee of God's favor because they were of the lineage of Abraham. This was, after all, what the Judaizers had rooted themselves in. But even before Jesus, remember John the Baptist, his forerunner, he had dared to confront the Jews on their erroneous claim to their right standing with God. John spoke. Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Remember the meaning of repentance we discussed during our time in Galatians 2. We're going to break it down just a little bit. Repentance is a noun. I tried to, I listened to YouTube videos how to say these words, and then I would forget them, but so I'm not even going to try. But there it is, <laughs> metanoia or something. Literally, this noun means a change of mind. This noun comes from the verb, which means to change one's mind or purpose. The verb is made up of a preposition and a verb, and the preposition means with, among, or after, and the verb means to perceive or think. So literally, to repent means to think differently afterwards. To change after being with. Isn't that cool? So I don't, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I do like looking at the original language. Um, but So repentance means a change of mind, a change of our thinking. And John the Baptist was saying, hey, bear fruit in keeping with a change of thinking after being confronted with the truth about the true lineage of Abraham. But they had persisted, and Jesus also reiterated the same message. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed, in John 8, 36-39. Jesus said, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. And later, he will tell them exactly who their father is. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. Jesus was telling those who were steeped in their ancestral traditions, even though you are of the physical bloodline of Abraham, unless you change your thinking about my word, then you are not doing the deeds of Abraham. Why? Because Abraham believed in the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That was what was credited him, his believing. And though Abraham was far from perfect, he had been declared righteous because of his faith and only his faith. And so we come to the story of Hagar. Paul would relate this piece of history of which these Judaizers and all devout Jews were all too aware. And immediately Paul spotlights the fact that Abraham came, from Abraham came not one, but two distinct lineages. In 422, for it is written, that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son by the free woman through the promise. One lineage came by his son Ishmael, born by the works of the flesh, and the other through his son Isaac, born through the promise. Now this, of course, begs the question, to which lineage society do we actually belong? My dad had two wives. 
Together, my dad with my mom had two children, my sister Janine and me. But when I was 18, the first of three more kids were born to my dad with his second wife. I love my half-siblings, but the fact is, we have different mothers, period. And that fact will never change. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul describes the significance of these two mothers in Abraham's lineage, asserting a spiritual truth figuratively conveyed through each. In verse 24, he says, This is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants. Now, Paul is in no wise saying the account of Abraham with his wife Sarah and her maidservant Hagar and the birth of the two sons Ishmael and Isaac is only an allegory. The allegorical sense that Paul utilizes here does not eliminate the literal account. Paul is not advocating a search for hidden meaning in the Old Testament. Doing that can become a tool to manipulate God's word to say whatever the one holding the tool desires it to say. Martin Luther offered a warning about the use of allegories that we would do well to heed. Unless a person has a thorough knowledge of Christian doctrine, he had better leave allegories alone. We are always to interpret scripture literally, and we are not to allegorize scripture. Scripture says what it means and means what it says. Now, some prophecies in the Old Testament and the book of Revelations use language that is clearly figurative. I heard something like, I saw one like. But unless a passage is clearly presented as figurative or an allegory, we are to interpret the events described as factual. But Matthew Henry offers a little further insight on this verse. These things are an allegory wherein, beside the literal and historical sense of the words, the Spirit of God points out something further. And Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, using the actual, factual, historical account of these two women, will point us further to his grace that works to prove our lineage. And so he concludes. Continues. This is allegorically speaking. These two women are two covenants. One proceeding from Mount Sinai bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Verse 25. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem. For she is in slavery with her children. And the allegory is this. Hagar, the bondwoman, represents the law given on Mount Sinai and corresponds to the present Jerusalem. Barnes notes on the Bible talks about present Jerusalem. Jerusalem as it is now, meaning that is in the days of Paul, is like Mount Sinai. It is subject to laws and rights and customs bound by a state of servitude and fear and trembling, such as existed when the law was given on Mount Sinai. If you read that account in Exodus, the people shook with tremendous fear because the smoke was rising the mountain was trembling it was a fearful event and barnes goes on to say there is no freedom there are no great and liberal views there is none of the liberty which the gospel imparts to men and the allegory put forth is clear the bondwoman produces children after her kind that's how God created the world, and it produced life after its kind. <clears throat> Those of the lineage of Hagar of our, are of the law and remain in bondage, in slavery and in fear, with no hope of rescue or freedom from the law. But, and don't you just love that little word, but. It's often one of the most consequential words in Scripture. The present Jerusalem represents those who rely on the law, those who are of the lineage of Hagar, but, and Paul proceeds to explain, but the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. Sarah represents the free woman, the Jerusalem above, and those who come from the lineage of the free woman are declared righteous through faith in his promise. Remember, the son by the free woman through the promise. If we need convincing, 
Let's remember the mess Abraham and Sarah made when they thought God needed help to fulfill his promise. And by their works, the son of the bondwoman was birthed. And as if more convincing was needed, Paul would bring the Judaizers back to what they claimed to know so well, as he quotes from the esteemed prophet Isaiah in verse 27. For it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For no, more numerous are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. As I went to Isaiah to find this quote, I was struck with this thought. How was I able to so quickly find this quote? On the internet, copied and pasted, consulted Dr. Google, and he told me the chapter and verse, Isaiah 54, 1. And it was another reminder of how God had so equipped Paul for his ministry through his God-breathed word. And remember, there were no chapters. There were no verses back then. The Apostle Paul is a great source of encouragement for us to be diligent in our study of the Word of God, to be equipped as his worker in his kingdom, so that we would not get tangled up in useless arguments, but by his Holy Spirit, we would be enabled to exhort others in truth, in the truth of his grace that works. And let us also take to heart the reminder that Paul sent to Timothy, penned in his final letter written before his death. He said, remind them, Timothy, of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth, but avoid worldly and empty chatter for it will lead to further ungodliness. Paul was not dealing with a lot of, of useless chatter. He went right to the source, right to the truth. Isaiah's prophecy, quoted by Paul, who accurately handled the word of truth, foretold of God's exact purpose for his people. From the barren and desolate woman, more numerous than from the fleshly woman, he would bring forth the descendants of Abraham. This was God's promise, that the flesh would have nothing to do with it. And that is reason to break forth and shout. And Paul reminds the Galatians, Believers, you are from the lineage of Isaac, the son of promise, the son of the free woman, who was born not according to the flesh, not according to the works, therefore not into bondage, but born of the free woman according to the promise of God. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. Believers, our lineage is not proven in our works or even by our obedience. Our lineage is proven solely by his grace through our spiritual birth. Through our faith that receives Jesus Christ, his grace works to prove our lineage through our new birth that is according to his will. As John wrote in chapter 1, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. But as we all know, being in the will of God does not guarantee a life without affliction. And again, Paul reminds his readers of the reality of persecution in the believer's life. Because the truth is, some things never change. And he writes, But as at that time, meaning at the time of Isaac, he who was born according to the flesh, Ishmael, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, Isaac. So it is now also. Paul is recounting the events that were described in Genesis 21, when Abraham threw a great feast the day that Isaac was weaned, and it was the last straw for Sarah. The child grew, Isaac, and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. Now Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, mocking. Therefore she said to Abraham, Drive out this maid and her son, for the son of this maid shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. Spurgeon puts it this way, The legalist is irritated by the doctrine of free grace and mocks it. 
But this mocking was akin to persecution. Often we think persecution is only about the stories we hear that are centered around extreme torture, being martyred for the faith, or undergoing great loss. But according to the word of God, mocking, making sport of, ridiculing a person of faith in God's dictionary is likened unto persecution. Why? I don't know, but I think perhaps it's because we were created for community. And with that innate desire to belong. And when we feel like the outcast, we can be tempted to do what it takes to fit in. The enemy is quick in his schemes to mock us in hopes of weakening our firm stand in the faith. But there's more. This word persecuted that Paul used in his letter to the Galatians describing what Isaac endured at the hands of Ishmael and what the Galatians were now encountering from the Judaizers means to put to flight, pursue, by implication, to persecute. Strong's exhaustive concordance defines the verb, whatever, however you say it in Greek, to aggressively chase like a hunter pursuing a catch. These Judaizers were on the hunt. Who does that remind you of? Remember Paul on Peter's words of caution? Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring liar, lion seeking someone to devour. The Judaizers were prowling around, looking, seeking to devour the Galatians' faith. We must be alert, sobered up in our spirit man by the truth. Being teased and ridiculed for our faith, being treated as an outcast because we believe his gospel of grace, should actually be expected. We, we must remember, though, that the enemy is not omniscient. The enemy is not the creator. His tactics are old and therefore predictable. The enemy aggressively chases us. Well, actually not us. Our faith. In the gospel of grace, rather than being surprised, let's be ready, prepared by his truth to boldly deal with lies that we need to compromise so we can fit in, whether it be with the libertines or the legalists. Ladies, we live in a culture now that is asking everybody to compromise except for evil. But if it's good, you got to compromise with it so that you don't, you're not a bigot and you're not prejudiced and we need to be equipped and armed with the truth of the word of God. And yes, we can expect persecution. But the line of his lineage is clearly drawn. And when reading the account of Abraham sending Hagar and Ishmael away in Genesis 21, it almost seems somewhat cruel. Was it really necessary to cast out the bondwoman and her son? After all, even Abraham was distressed over it. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because of his son. And this son is Ishmael. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you to do, tells you, listen to her. For through Isaac, your descendants shall be named. God was clearly drawing the line. Faith and works don't mix. We are not to compromise our faith in his grace with our works of the law. We are not even to keep works around. And the events of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar are an explicit depiction of what happens when we stop believing his promise and try to help God out with our works. And Paul wraps up this portion of his argument by planting the Galatians firmly in their lineage. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. Galatians, all who have trusted Christ through faith, know your lineage. We are children of the free woman, born according to his promise that will never be eradicated. For all that he has promised by his word, he will accomplish. As it so beautifully says in Isaiah, so worth reading every single day. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout 
and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be, which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. So this month is National Family History Month, but we don't have to wait for October to celebrate and commemorate our heritage. We can celebrate every day because Jesus said, even more than coming out on top against the mocking enemy is our place in his family that has been recorded in heaven. And Jesus said, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Does that blow your mind? It blows my mind. We don't have to sign up for Ancestry.com or jump through any hoops to discover our family history. Our ancestry has been recorded in heaven and confirmed by his word. Isaiah, what he has said, he will accomplish. We have only to rest in our position. We are in line for the inheritance we have in Christ. Not because we do all the right things or avoid all the wrong things, but because through faith in Christ we have been born as children of promise. Born not into bondage, but into the lineage of the Son of God, who sets us free. And that's exactly where we're going to begin to dig in next week. The freedom that we have through our lineage in Jesus Christ. And by faith, we know that the burden of proof lies solely on the shoulders of the one who spread his arms and carried our sin to the cross. Bore our sin in the most marvelous display of grace the world would ever know. And on that we can rest. For it's his grace that worked to prove our lineage. Amen? Amen. Amen. Next week, we'll be in Galatians 1 through 15. Let's pray. Father, how amazed we are at what you've done for us and how you have made us part of your family. You've written our names in heaven when we placed our faith in you and we are forever in your book of life and we have an inheritance that is promised and a lineage that is proven through the work of Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. We are so grateful, and I just pray, God, you continue to stir us up with a deep hunger that we would grow to be like Paul, to accurately handle your word of truth, that we would be equipped as your workers for your glory and your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, ladies, small group time.